All right, thank you. Good evening, everyone. As you can see here, my name is Jair. I was made in Brazil uh, from end to end. Um, so I am working as, thank you. I'm working as engineer director at Carta. Um, see, great, it's working. And just to let you know what we do, we have pri private and public companies uh, as well as investors and other type of stakeholders to manage their equity uh, online and um, you know manage the cap table and all of the things that are around that, such as investments and financing, valuations, and etc. So, you know, without no further ado, uh, what we're going to talk today is clean architecture. How many people here actually knows or have heard about clean architecture before? Can you raise your hand? Cool. And how many people have uh, heard about solid principles or something like that? Cool, great. <laughs> cool, uh, so that might be interesting today. Um, one thing that I'd like to add here is that when we talk about engineering, we are always excited about infrastructure, excited about the new technology or the new tool that we can use. And sometimes we actually forget about the application itself and what we are trying to build and deliver to our customers. So clean architecture help you to focus more on your uh, application, your system, than on those things that are around your system. So basic concepts. Clean architecture is basically a group of rules that allow you to develop software cleaner uh, and easier to maintain, to, write, to, to develop tests and also to uh, switch components as you go and as you grow. So scalability is also very important, uh, as well as readability. When we take a look at the rules that we have for clean architecture, some of them uh, might be interesting. And sorry for that picture. I lost my presentation, I'm using slide tech, so the picture is a little bit weird. But um, the, some of the rules that we can talk about here is the dependency rule, which means that high-level components should always avoid depending on low-level components. And by taking a look at that picture here, what we mean by low-level components and high-level components is that the components in the middle, they are high-level. Everything on the edge is basically low-level. What that means for you is that usually what happens is that all your components in the middle tends to change less than components that are on the edge. So we, whenever you need to switch a database, whenever you need to switch a framework, or whenever you need to change a controller or any, an endpoint, that's a change that's more likely to happen than you actually change the data model for users, for example. So the other thing that we have here is the screaming architecture. Again, everything that is in the middle uh, is considered high-level components, and those things should scream the domain of your application. So when you see uh, here we are talking about food, for example, your application should reflect the domain uh, business of your, of your company. And that's why this is kind of decoupled from everything else. The other thing is database, web, frameworks are simple details. Right? It doesn't matter where you are persisting the data, what matters is how you're persisting it and how you're you know, guaranteeing the integrity uh, and the validation of this data. And cohesion and coupling. Uh, I think most of us that have worked with OOP before have heard about this. And just to be clear about uh, what cohesion means, so this is actually coupling. So I don't know if you have watched this movie before, but like, this is very much like coupling. Um, it's really hard to separate them. And the thing about cohesion, um, so I'm Brazilian. This for me is football because you play with foot. With the foot. <laughs> and this thing actually is handball, right? Which makes much more sense. Uh, it's more <laughs> cohesive with that. So just messing up with a, with a little Americans here. Great, coming back to the <laughs> presentation. So that's actually how you uh, uh, differentiate that. And what you try to do in your application is to have high cohesion, which means that things that are grouping together make sense together, and they change for the same reason, and low coupling, which means that you can point to different directions as you go. Great. 
So solid principles, that was why I asked about this. This is, those are the principles where uh, the clear architecture is based off. So single responsibility principle, I think everybody have heard about that before. Uh, and the way that you heard about it is that, you know, components should do only one thing, or functions should do only one thing, or microservice should do only one thing and do it well. I would actually say that single responsibility principle means that things that are grouped together should change for the same reason. Which means that you may have a system that uh, your CFO of the company cares about, so therefore things should be together there because they're going to change for the same reason. When we take a look at the open close principle, your components, your systems, your applications, everything should be open for expansion and last open for change. What that means is that when you're building your application, you try to give uh, alternatives to extension, but you don't want to change the underlying behavior. What you want to do is actually help people to add behavior to it, but not change your behavior. This name that I, I don't know if I can pronounce that, least Cobb, I think, substitution principle. Uh, that is interesting. So whenever you have a, um, a abstract class or even a, a, a B class in your uh, system and then you have a child, like someone, some class that is inherited from that uh, other class, you should be able to substitute at any moment in your system, uh, substitute the father by, the, by the, the son, right, by the child. So whenever you need to use, let's suppose that you are running an application and you need to pass in an object that's actually a inheritance from the main object, that should be fine because they all have the same interface that shouldn't broke, uh, break your system. And interface segregation, that also is, uh, talks about uh, the interface of your components. If you are thinking about cohesion, that shouldn't be a problem for you because whenever you, you have clients consuming your classes or your APIs, they're going to use exactly what they need. They are not going to rely on a huge API because they don't need to. So you're going to build these smaller components that have only what makes sense for that. The last one, dependency inversion principle, means that going back to this uh, picture here, Everything in the middle shouldn't have any dependence, and everything on the edge can depend on the middle, which means that high-level components cannot depend on low-level components. That's important because, remember when I said that low-level components change very often? If you change the low-level components for some reason, and you have high-level components depending on that, that means that you may have to change the high-level components. But if it's a high-level thing, that means that you have a lot of other things that depend on that thing. When you change that, you're going to you know, start to run in circles, and you're going to have to change a bunch of things in your system, and you don't want to do that. So let's take a look on code. I think that's actually what is interesting. We're going to start with the entities layer, right? which is the encapsulation for enterprise business rules. I'm going to show you some code here. This is a you know, small application that I did uh, just to present the concepts. Um, so here I have my domain, which is auth. That's a, an application to authenticate credentials, right? So auth is my domain, and I have entities here. When I go to entities, I see two entities right here. Credentials, those are like, here I only have username, password, if it's active or not. And can you, can you all see that? Yeah, I think so. Um, if it's act, is active or not, and the ID of the user. That's the only thing that it has. You should notice as well that this is not a Django model. This is ju just a Python object. And here I have some behaviors that I'm expecting from this credential. Um, one of them is how to set password. The other one is how to verify a password and how to deactivate. An important thing here, and that's why I have this double underscore here, it's I don't want to expose the internals of these credentials to the rest of the system. I want you to use my interface to change the state of the object. 
Therefore, I can guarantee validation. I can make sure that the integrity of the data is intact. That's why I'm doing this. This model, this uh, entity is also very unlikely, uh, unlike to change. You know, there's not much that you can add to a credential. Like, credential is just basically it. If you are talking about user, first name, last name, this is actually user profile. That's not a credential. When we go to encryptor, same thing. Like, this is just trying to encrypt uh, whatever I pass in, and that's very unlikely to change. There's another component that I'm going to talk real quick here, which is password. I'm considering this uh, what we call uh, object values. And this is only meant to be for passwords. And the reason why this is a different object, uh, when you see the concept between uh, object values and entities, is that entities actually represent your business. And when you see two different entities, you can actually uh, uh, define whether they are equal or not. A password is actually just a value. So if you don't have the password attached to any credential, it doesn't make sense to compare them. Cool. So what we have here is actually this structure. We have credentials that depends on password, that depends on encryption. But all are together in the entities uh, level which is a high-level component. You're going to see now that this thing doesn't depend on anything else. Use cases. This is actually an interesting layer that I like a lot. Um, the use cases are basically the flows of your system. And when you think about what you're going to implement, where you want to put your business logic, I consider that this is the play best place for you to put your business logic. And the reason why is because you can test it better, you don't need to rely on the framework, you don't need to touch the database, you can do whatever you want, and unit tests become really, really simple. So, let's take a look at the code real quick. Um, here we have use cases. And then I have a use case which is create credential. The create credential receives a repository, I'm going to talk about this uh, in a minute. And it performs an action here. Oops. Yeah, it performs an action here. First, it tries, it checks if the credential already exists. If so, it raises an exception. If not, it's going to create a credential, an object, and pass it to the repository to persist the data. The great thing about this thing here is that I don't care about where I'm persisting the data. I can today persist the data in the Postgres, tomorrow persist in Redis, and later persist on, I don't know, you know, any, any other database, MySQL or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, my use case is completely free of that. So, let's move back here. What I have here is a credential. And remember when we talked about open close principle? This is being open. I'm providing an interface for other systems that want to talk to me to implement that and therefore, I'm open for you to add behaviors as you go. But I'm not changing how I behave. Cool. So, oops, sorry. So let's go back to code. Let's take a look uh, on the next, next layer, which is interface and adapters. That's actually uh, how you, your code, your business domain, you start to talk uh, to the external world. That's basically how you make this transition, this bridge. And then, take a look at the code here. Remember the interface that we created for repositories. If we take a look on the infrastructure side, we're going to find... Oops. Let me just check here. Oh, adapters, sorry. We're going to find an adapter for Django. This is a repository that's going to get a credential and persist the data using the Django model. So here, this is an implementation of that interface that I shared. If I want to implement that with SQL Alchemy, I can do that pretty easy. Like it doesn't matter. As long as, as I have as long as I have those those methods here in place, my use case will work perfectly. So 
that's uh, part of the, the, this bridge between the, the framework now and the my, in my business domain. Cool. The final, yes, so here's how, what I have. I have an auth service that I'm gonna, I, I didn't show, but I can show later. And I have a credential repository here that implements this interface. Cool. The last layer is infrastructure. Here is where Django lives. And I'm going to show you real quick. Uh, right here, infrastructure. Here I have a Django application, as you can see right here. And in the account, I have my modules, which is pretty simple. Uh, I'm relying on Django uh, model, and I'm just adding the UUID. I have, oops, I have my views that are going to receive a request, and I have forms that will validate the inputs. And the interesting thing about views, and the way that I, I like to um, approach Django, is basically a module is just for you to persist the data, uh, which it, it implements the active record pattern. But the, for, the, the view uh, in Django, it's basically to validate the input, delegate the process, get the output, and return back to the client. That's all I think the view should do. Um, nothing else. So in this case, I'm doing exactly that. I'm using the form to validate the input. Here, I'm not validating if the password is strong or not. That's the business logic. But I'm validating if password matches with the confirmed password. I'm just validating inputs. I'm not validating the content. When we take a look at the view, what happens is that I get the validation from the form. If it's valid, I just perform the operation using the service and then gets the, back, gets the, the output and sends it back to the client. This it's very decoupled because now I have, again, remember I told you, infrastructure lives in the edge, right? So the infrastructure can change. It doesn't matter if I'm using Flask, Django, whatever. As long as I'm consuming the auth service and passing the data there, I'm fine. And as long as I provide, in the auth service, I provide some kind of repository, I'm also fine. So let's take a look at some of the uh, like the final architecture with this. We have register view, which is in the top. We have the user account uh, model. And as you can see, the layer in green is actually the bridge for my system in the bottom. And when you take a look, those are the layers. We have entities, use cases, interface adapters, and infrastructure on the top. So let's take a look on um, this working. How this work? Oops. Sorry. Great. So I should be able to. Yes. So if we go to localhost register, if I have my system here, if I try to put a credential that I read to this. It's going to just do, tell me that password needs to match, which is include validation. If the password match, you're going to tell me invalid email. That's a business validation, so we can take a look here on the credential, uh, actually on the use case. So you go to credential, you're going to see that credential already exists. So that's a validation business that lives in the use case. If we have anything here, oh, this is kind of hard to type here. Let me try this. Dot com. Oh, I match. I didn't match. God. I'm creating a problem for myself. Well, you got the point. (laughs) (laughs) 
Why is it so hard to type? One second. Here. So let me check, uh, let me take a look, let me show you one interesting thing about the validation. So we have the validation for credentials here. So we are just making sure that we are not uh, adding a duplicated credential. In the entity, uh, we have, in the password, we have a validation for the type of the password, like if, if it's strong or not, that lives in the password, which is the responsibility of the password object. And I want to show you some uh, benefits of this, right? The first thing is the separation of concerns. Um, the, each one of those layers, um, they have low coupling and high cohesion. Like on the entities, you only have entities validating the integrity of the data that you are trying to put in. In the use case, you have the business logic that actually perform the operations. Uh, when you take a look at the repositories and, and uh, presenters, like the, the bridge there, that's how you talk to the external world. So you don't rely on the external world, uh, you rely on this, this bridge. And lastly, you have, uh, you have this, this layer that actually uh, represents the external world. That also gives you better testing. And they have some tests here that I can show you. Uh, if we go to auth and use cases, for example. One interesting thing about use cases, remember I told you, I don't need to rely on any repository that, uh, repository that comes from outside. I can, I can write my own repository for my tests. And that's it. I just, I just write for my use case, run it, test, and it becomes really simple. I have a test for init, for the execute, and that's it. When I want to test entities, that's also easy. So I'm testing credential here. There's no dependency. As you can see here, I only depend on myself and password. Besides of that, I'm fine. I can test pretty easy fast. And also, if you are complaining about your test you know, taking too long to run, like when you build things that way, they're going to be like this. Cool, uh, here. Flexibility. The thing about flexibility is that, is that, as you saw here, I don't depend, like the layers, you, are, you build layers on top of layers. I can replace any one of those layers pretty easy. And I've, I've talked about this here. Uh, it gives you a lot of flexibility as you scale uh, your system. So let's suppose that now you are talking to external service, no longer to a local uh, uh, module. That's not a problem. As long as you pass a client in that implements the same interface, easy. However, for startups, we know that this is quite a lot of work. And I want to just give you some advice for you as you do your stuff. I know that you probably will walk away from here and say, look, I'm not going to do it. I'm not, not going to do all those classes and those weird things that looks like Java. I hate Java. <laughs> um, I understand that. I, you know, I, I've done both, and I'm, I'm not proud of it. So, um, so the thing is that, okay, fine, embrace the framework, but act as it wasn't there. And what I mean by this is try to write adapters for things that you're doing. Um, I don't know if you have heard about the adapter pattern, but it's basically create a, a sheen layer on top of anything that you're consuming from the outside then you don't need to, to rely that heavily on what is presenting to you. And I always advise you to have methods to run your queries for ORIL. And the reason why, I work in a pretty big code base. And I can tell you right now that we have queries all over the place. And that's a nightmare to maintain. Every time you need to change the way that you consume data, you have to go over the whole code base and change that. That's not easy. But when you have methods, if everyone is relying on the methods, as long as the signature is the same, fine. You change whatever you want. Build independent modules. This is uh, 
an interesting thing regarding to Django because it's so easy to add a, a foreign key from one module, a, a Django app to another. That's so easy to do. But I'm not, I'm not sure if you want to do that. Uh, so that's why you focus on high cohesion between your Django apps. So you, if you have models that need to depend on each other, great, they, they live in the same app. But if you, as soon as you have things depending on something else outside of that app, be careful. Because at some point, you might want to extract that out and put that in another place. That's going to be a nightmare as well. We've done that now, and I can tell you it's not fun. And the other thing is like, delegate responsibilities, but don't blindly trust it. What I mean by that is, again, write adapters for whatever you use. Um, then you're going to probably like, be more secure uh, moving forward. Always revisit your code. Please do that. Um, we have, at Carta, we are a five years old company. Um, we started to revisit our code like two years ago, and that was hard. If you iterate fast, like ship, iterate again, ship, iterate again, that's going to be make your life way easier. And I think that's it. Oh, one more thing. We are hiring. If you want to do things like that, please uh, come talk to me. Cool, thank you.